So uh, welcome back to um, this morning session. The second talk is given by Professor Andrew Sandy from uh, Boston University. And the title of the talk is uh, Significance of Two Land Scales and then Confined Common Critical Point. Let's welcome Professor Sandy. Okay, thank you very much and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to Taiwan again. It's great to be here. So, uh, this work I'm going to talk about today, I've been working on occasionally for the past 10 years or so, so it has been a long uh, uh, project. Uh, and today I want to talk to you mainly about uh, some uh, recent uh, developments uh, done in collaboration with uh, Wei Shao, who is now shared postdoc between uh, the Computational Center in Beijing and, and Boston which in practice means that today she's in Boston and tomorrow she will be in Beijing. <laughs> she's just at the transition now and then she will come back to Boston again. Uh, and uh, Wen Anguo, and she was actually uh, Wen Anguo's uh, student at the uh, uh, Beijing Normal University. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is essentially the phase transition, the quantum phase transition taking place between uh, the nail state in two dimensions and a two-dimensional spin one half system and uh, a valence bond solid or if you will a valence bond uh, crystal which is a you know, crystal of singlets. So this is uh, uh, something that has proved quite uh, challenging uh, to figure out exactly what's going on uh, between those uh, ground states. Okay, so a quick outline here. So uh, I'm doing mainly computational studies. So we'll talk about uh, you know spin models and simulations of those models, not really talking about any technical aspects of uh, the simulations, but showing you results. Uh, so I know the audience is quite broad here, so let me give a quick introduction first about the Heisenberg model itself in two dimensions and its uh, properties, and then uh, a simple example of how we can accomplish a quantum phase transition in uh, such a system. Bef uh, before moving on to this, uh, more uh, complex state, which again we call a valence bond uh, sol solid. So I want to talk a little bit about models, systems where we can have such ground states, uh, and then how we can accomplish the transition into into that state. Uh, and, and that's uh, you know what's called deconfined criticality. It turns out there's a very interesting type of uh, quantum phase uh, transition uh, between those. And that's, uh, that, that transition is exactly what we try to characterize using large-scale quantum Monte Carlo simulations. So we'll tell you a little bit about uh, critical exponents. Uh, one of the main uh, focus topics uh, in this last stage of this, latest stage of this project, is actually to look at, look at domain walls in this valence console. So that turns out to give us a lot of information about what's going on. And uh, there, there's two, two length scales in this problem, so that's actually one reason why it's so challenging and uh, interesting as well. So it's quantum criticality in the presence of two divergent uh, length scales. So basically at the end, uh, I will actually tell you uh, what I believe uh, is a revision about uh, standard wisdoms of uh, quantum criticality uh, in systems where we have uh, two length scales. Okay. So the starting point in what we are doing is, uh, is the 2D Heisenberg model. So I think you all know what it is. We have spin one half uh, uh, spins, as you two spins, and they are coupled with these nearest neighbor uh, interactions. So the order parameter of this system, since we have a, uh, this kind of staggered order, if you write down the magnetization, or we call it the sub magnetization or staggered magnetization, is just summing all the spins with this uh, phase factor here. And uh, if you want to answer the question whether or not this system has long-range order at zero temperature, we know that it cannot have any long-range order at finite temperature, but it can at zero temperature. So if we want to answer that uh, you know, from a computational perspective, it's useful to look at, well, we are almost always forced to look at finite system sizes. Then we look at the square of this order parameter, and then we look at the behavior as the system size goes to infinity. So uh, if, if that remains larger than zero, then we have long-range order. 
So we don't break any symmetries with the kind of calculations I'm, I'm talking about. So that's why we look at the squared order parameters. The magnetization itself would always uh, vanish in the final system. So we do quantum Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, and basically we can do those without any approximations at all. So we have finite size, but for the model on that finite lattice, we can get the result without any approximations. And then we can try to do this extrapolation, which is the main challenge there. Okay, it's also a challenge to do the calculations because they take a lot of uh, CPU time, right? Uh, okay, so in this particular model, this is very well known, so I just wanted to talk about it as an introduction. Uh, it was first convincingly shown by, uh, shown by uh, Rager and uh, Peter Young uh, using wordline quantum Monte Carlo simulations that uh, there is a sublattice magnetization of the system and it's 60% of the classical value. Think of, of the classical value as what you get if you have vectors of length one half here. Okay. Uh, so now just to show you what we can do, uh, you know, 30, uh, about 26 years later or something like that. Well, this was done in 2010. Uh, so here we went up to systems of size 256 squared, uh, and we compute the square of this order parameter, I call it big M square here. Uh, and then we graph the results as a function of 1 over the system length, and then we extrapolate in, and we extrapolate with some high order polynomials. And we can define this order parameter in, in, in a couple of different ways. Let me not talk about this in detail. But OK, by the way, I mean, I know these flowers, the nice flowers here, hide the view here. So I'm pointing here because I see, but you can always look at these side screens, I guess, when you see that. You, you see flowers instead. Right? Uh, anyway, so now you see we have it at uh, to five decimal places, which you may think is more than anybody needs. But you know, some people like to, to have accurate results. It's good for benchmarking all kinds of calculations. Uh, okay, so now the NEL state, okay, it's experimentally important and nice, but we would like to do something more interesting. We would like to destroy the NEL order. We feel uh, a little bit uh, destructive. We want to do something, uh, something else. So uh, the question is what we can do to the Heisenberg model to make it lose the long range order, okay? Uh, and we can do many things. As an introduction, I want to tell you that, uh, just about some very simple thing uh, we can do. And we can uh, dimerize the system. So if you look at this uh, graph here, we can introduce in the plane two types of couplings. And you should think of the red one as stronger than the blue one, but these are both the Heisenberg type of couplings that I showed before. Uh, an almost uh, identical way of doing it in, in practice is to couple two different planes. Uh, you know, so if in the plane you have the same J1 coupling and then you have a J2 coupling between the planes. So now you can imagine what happens if this J2 becomes very large, or if you will, uh, J1 becomes very small. You can then think of these as, as basically isolated dimers. And then, of course, the Heisenberg coupling on a dimer just gives you a singlet uh, in, in the ground state if you have an antiferromagnetic coupling. So in that limit, when this ratio is very large, you basically get a system of uh, independent uh, dimers, which, of course, has no magnetic long-range order. But then as you change this ratio, uh, make it smaller, at one point we have to get to what we just discussed, the uh, uniform Heisenberg model where you have long range orders. In between, there's actually a, uh, a quantum phase transition where uh, you uh, uh, lose the order if you come from this side. And we know that here we have spin wave excitation, so the system is gapless, and this is a gap phase, so the spin gap opens up there. And there are some interesting finite temperature Properties associated with it. This, this, this is what happens in the ground state. The finite temperature, there's no long range order, but you can look at the correlation length and so on, and it has different behaviors in, in these phases. Okay, this has been studied uh, a, a lot over the past uh, 20, 25 years or so. So, this uh, quantum critical point here is quite well understood. One can just see it basically from symmetries. You have a 2D quantum system, so you can map it to a, a three-dimensional classical Heisenberg model in some sense, and then we expect that it's in the same universality class as the classical Heisenberg model, and many numerical studies using many different dimerization patterns and so on uh, have confirmed that. Okay, so that's, that's well understood. 
Okay, but the key here is that we have these uh, uh, timers, right? So, so we have manually made the system to prefer having the singlets on uh, these timers. So this uh, face here to the right is, is not that exciting. It's just this collection of singlets. Of course, as you approach a critical point, there will be lots of quantum fluctuations. Uh, so still, it, it's interesting to, to study you know, quantum fluctuations around here. But the ground state itself is is uh, a non-degenerate and is quite simple to understand it. Okay, so what? Uh, and again, the key is we have two spins per unit cell, or you can have four or six or something like that if you want to make it more complicated. But it's an even number of spins per unit cell that lets us have these this kind of dimer formation. So now I want to talk about some more complex, more complicated non-magnetic states where you just have one spin per unit cell. So we start with the Heisenberg model without any sort of uh, destruction of the translational invariance by hand. Uh, and we add some other terms, uh, which also uh, uh, still maintain this property of one spin per unit cell. So you can think of uh, just a, a uniform square lattice with some interactions. So then we can still, of course, have the nail state, but now we can also get some uh, other types of, of non-magnetic states that are more exciting. So we can get spin liquids, or RVB, whatever you want to call them. There are many types of uh, possible spin liquid phases. We can also get these valence bond solids uh, that I uh, talked about before. So both these types of states are uh, good to discuss uh, using valence bonds. So valence bonds is just another name for a singlet forming between two spins. Okay, so here the spins are nearest neighbors, but you can have valence bonds that go further away as well. So the RVB in the simplest kind of cartoon picture is just a soup of, uh, of such uh, short valence bonds. So you have a superposition of, of all these uh, singlet configurations. So that state in two dimensions doesn't have any uh, long-range magnetic order. It doesn't have any, any order at all. So that's why we call it a, a liquid. Okay, a valence bond solid, on the other hand, has some uh, uh, crystallization of, of these uh, singlets. So you can think of it as a, as a system where there's some residual interactions between these singlets so that it wants to form, form these, these bonds. Although you should know that the singlets themselves are, you can think of them as emergent objects because the Hamiltonian is really written in terms of individual spins. And here, uh, you know, the, these, these singlets that want to form here, form here spontaneously. So the dimers form and, and, and crystallize. Uh, so it's quite different from the case I told you before where you put some couplings which uh, uh, force the, the singlets to go on some, uh, some particular uh, uh, bonds. Here, the ground state is actually uh, degenerate because you can form these patterns in different ways. On the square lattice, you can form them in, in four different ways, so the ground state would be fourfold degenerate. So that's much more interesting than a, 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 than a, de a non degenerate ground state. So, of course, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned, singlets can form between uh, uh, sites that are separated by some longer distance as well, and in fact, this. This, uh, uh, sing these singlets, if you consider all possible uh, lengths of them, uh, they uh, form an overcomplete basis in which you can expand any singlet state. But it's overcomplete, so there's not a unique way to expand the given state. And of course, when we talk about RVB and VBS as well, there will normally be fluctuations, for example, in the VBS on top of this pattern. So this is just a, a cartoon picture. Okay, so now. For a long time, at least I had the impression that uh, people regarded the valence bond solid as a very boring state. Okay, it's just some uh, crystal of singlets. What, what, what's that? It's similar to you know these dimerized models that I talked to you about before. But it turns out that actually the physics of these valence bond states is, is quite rich. Uh, well, the focus has been, of course, in the last few years to look at uh, fine uh, singlet, uh, uh, spin liquid states and so on. But valence bond solid states, as you will see, are also very rich. So let me talk about one aspect of that, and that's exactly this uh, so-called deconfined criticality. 
and uh, uh, this peak of uncriticality term was introduced in this paper by Sentil et al. And, and one of the authors, we on balance, is here in the audience. Uh, so this was already more than 10 years ago, uh, but what is it? So again, it's imagine that you start from a Heisenberg model and then you put some other interactions in there. And now these interactions should be such that they favor the formation of this valence bond solid that I uh, talked to you about. So then the proposal was that you could have this kind of uh, uh, situation that as a function of this G here, you weaken uh, the order parameter of, of the antiferromagnet and at some point it vanishes and at the same point uh, you uh, start to build up this valence bond solid order in a continuous fashion. So both these order parameters vanish continuously at the same point. Now this is actually uh, uh, unusual because according to Land the, the Landau rules this should actually be a first order transition. If it happens at a single point, if there's no coexistence or other phase in between, then uh, actually uh, it should be a first order transition because these two phases break unrelated symmetries. Okay, so uh, uh, the basis of, of this proposal I cannot uh, discuss in detail, uh, but Leon is here, so during the lunch break you can uh, uh, contact him and, and ask more, but, but uh, basically there is such a proposal out there. And uh, there's also a field theory proposed to describe this critical point. And this is uh, uh, known as the CP1 uh, uh, quantum field theory, and uh, again I'm not a field theorist, so I will not even uh, explain all these terms here. Uh, but the, but there, there's a, it's a gauge uh, field uh, theory uh, coupled to these uh, spin-on uh, 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 fields. So the, the main uh, sort of from a practical standpoint proposal here is that that uh, this is a concrete proposal for you know what this critical point should be described by, and then one can uh, get various predictions from this field theory. And one prediction was that uh, uh, the transition should be continuous, so it should be an unusual situation. Uh, but uh, it, uh, there's no proof uh, of this really. So what was also done was to actually enhance the symmetry of this SU2 uh, uh, CP model to, to uh, uh, an SUN symmetry, so then it's called the CPN minus one model. So in, it's only in that limit one can really do any calculations for this theory and where most of these uh, predictions came from. And then, of course, uh, the question is uh, what happens for uh, you know, the realistic situation of small n that we could imagine uh, creating in, in some experiment. So there has been a lot of uh, work done uh, on models uh, numerically to try to uh, see what happens for n equals 2 and also for uh, other values of n. And not only to see if this transition is continuous, but really to calculate all kinds of properties of the transition and, and these phases, because the, the theory doesn't, as beautiful as it is, it doesn't really tell us that much, uh, I have to say. Right? I don't know if Liam will agree, but I think he agrees. Uh, so it's a very interesting proposal and an important one, because it really goes beyond uh, uh, the standard paradigm for quantum phase transitions, and there are proposals to how this may be important in, in contexts like high PC superconductivity where if you do uh, this kind of system exciting things may happen like uh, high PC superconductivity and so on. Colonic metals, all kinds of things. Uh, so it's, uh, it's important to try to understand what's really going on here and that's uh, uh, what we would like to do numerically to really figure out what's, what's going on. Okay, so uh, how can we uh, get this valence bond uh, uh, solid uh, state? Well, the standard way that people had in mind for a long time was to look at frustrated quantum spin models. So Leon mentioned in the previous talk the J1, J2 chain. So there's a J1, J2 two-dimensional model as well. And in this case, one would consider uh, uh, positive uh, couplings. Both J1 and J2 should be positive, so then it's, it's highly frustrated if, if these are of the same order. Uh, so this has been uh, studied for a long time, and uh, still it's not completely clear what's going on in this model, but more or less uh, 
Well, what is clear is that there's an L state for small g and there's a kind of stripe antiferromagnet for large g. That's very easy to understand if you just put in some spins here and try to minimize the energy. And in between, uh, most people used to believe it's a valence bond solid. So then you could act actually study the NL to VBS transition by going between them. Well, there are some uh, recent calculations suggesting that actually it's a, there is a spin liquid here in between, not a valence bond solid. I'm not sure I believe that so much, but uh, uh, so, so most likely I would say it's still this scenario, but there's some debate about that. Uh, if it's a valence bond solid, it could be uh, not necessarily a columnar phase, it could be some other kind of phase. One can actually form singlets on plaquettes and so on as well. Uh, but as you see from my discussion here, it's not exactly clear what's going on in this model, not even in terms of what phases exist. And why is that? Well, because this is a very difficult model to study numerically if we want to study it on large lattices. Want to Monte Carlo simulations, such as those I showed you for uh, the unfrustrated model, cannot be done because uh, this frustrated model is, is uh, affected by what's called the sign problem, which ma makes simulations essentially impossible. So there's some progress using DMRG and so on, but that's still pretty hard in two dimensions, so it's not so clear what's going on. So what, what can we do if we want to study an L to VBS transition? What, what kind of uh, systems could we do? So I, I proposed a way out of this uh, 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 some years ago. Uh, and it's a very simple proposal, in fact. So, if we look at the Heisenberg interaction, it's actually a singlet projector. So, if I if I take the define Cij in this way, this is just the Heisenberg interaction, and it's just a constant. So, this operator has the, the property oops, that it, uh, 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 if you act on on two sides, it projects out the singlet part of the state on that side, so it gets rid of the, tri uh, the triplet. You can easily check if you act on a singlet, you just get plus one times the singlet back again. So the Heisenberg model is basically minus Cij. So it's just uh, pro wants to project singlets on, on, on all the nearest neighbor bonds. Okay? So, and we know that that leads to nail order. But how about if we make products of, of these singlet projectors? For example, you know, a product like that, or even three in a product. Then uh, it, it's pretty clear that these interactions uh, somehow favor the formation of these correlated singlets. Right? So th th this interaction likes to have three singlets next to each other like that. And of course, we don't want to break the symmetry by hand, so we have to sit still sum this on the lattice, all translations and rotations of it, so that we don't break any symmetry by hand. But still, it's clear that this kind of interaction may uh, uh, like the VBS state. And in fact, uh, they do. So we can combine, for example, the Heisenberg interaction and this, what we call sometimes Q2 interaction, uh, in this way. And then there's actually a quantum phase transition as a function of this ratio Q over J. So for large J, it's a, an L, it has an L ground state. And for large Q, it has a valence bond solid ground state. So we can use this model to study this nl to BBS transition. And uh, uh, I should mention then that the, it, this interaction is maybe a little bit uh, artificial, you may think. Uh, so uh, and it, it, it's true. So it, it's not intended to describe any particular material in the microscopic sense. So this model is what we have now started to call a designer Hamiltonian. So it's designed to study uh, a certain type of phenomenon in, uh, uh, and also with the requirement that we have to be able to use some uh, efficient numerical technique to, to do it. So this satisfies that uh, criteria. So we can study valence bond solid physics and we can study this nail to VBS transition using this kind of model. So today I want to talk about what we have done with this to test this deconfined uh, quantum criticality scenario.